Are you ready for your today? Do you have your notes? Ready. Most of us, um, most of us struggle with different things. And if you ever noticed when, when you were going to church over your life, gathering at meetings, that there was always an emphasis. Uh, I remember when I was going to the Baptist church as a child, the emphasis was always on what you can't do. Was that ever your experience when you went to church meetings, that the emphasis was on what you can't do or what you shouldn't do? Do you ever notice that? Anybody agree with that? Oh, yeah. And it was about, you know, if you're a Christian, you don't do that. And that's true. It, it, it's true that as a Christian, there are things that God wants to change in us. But that isn't really the emphasis of the message of the gospel, is it? No. You see, when we look at it that way, we have the cart before the horse, so to speak. And if there's anybody here, and I'm not asking you to raise your hand, if there's anybody here that's been struggling in certain areas of their life, certain challenges that they've, or ways of life that they've gone back to, or that they've struggled with all of their life, and it seems to obsess their present life. That whatever they do, that's the thing that comes to the foreground. If you wake up in the morning thinking about, oh, I've done it again, I've done it again. Or, you know. God wants to begin to transform our understanding. We're going to be reading from Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 16. And you see, God's position on this is that He always gives us the solution, not the problem. We focus on, if only I can change so God can use me. And God says, no, if you will follow me, the change will come from following me. Right? Jesus said to His disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Sometimes we have been taught in our church meetings that our job as evangelism is to get out there and do evangelism. So in our struggle to try to do evangelism, we forget the part about the following me. And the evangelism is a natural outflow from following. It is not something we do independent of that, which is what we talked about last week, the interruptions of God, and interruptions of daily life. <clears throat> and in Galatians 5.16, we read this. It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You know what he didn't say to us? Here's the list of the things of the flesh, don't do them. He said to us, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Then he gives us a list. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in times past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, Faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another and envying one another. God is calling us to follow Him. He's calling us to seek after Him. You know, our enemy comes, the enemy which is the devil, the enemy which is worldly thinking, the enemy which is our society, those things are all in tune with the same kind of concept. They want us to see how um, much of a failure we are. Right? If I were to ask you here, how many of you sometimes in, when you get up in the morning feel like you're a failure, you, there would be some hands that would go up. Right? So it's not about those things, but it's about being transformed by applying the principles or the things that God wants us to do. Um, I don't know if you 
any of you ever wa used to watch Star Trek or that? But I used to watch Star Trek when I was younger. I still yeah. watch it the odd time in that. And in that, there was um, the main character of the old Star Trek, the old, old Star Trek, was Captain James T. Kirk. Shatner. William Shatner. Yeah. And, if you, uh, and if you know the story of how he was able to be promoted and, and, and he, he won that, he, he beat the only, he was the only man ever to beat the test at Starfleet Academy that was the no-win scenario. And he, he, that's right. And he won it by, well, no, he reprogrammed the computer. So that was called, one man called it cheating, another man called it improvisation. And I'm not advocating cheating, but what I am advocating is a belief in the no-win scenario. I do not believe in a no-win scenario. I do not believe that whatever situation you're in, Whatever the doctor has told you, whatever your ex-wife has told you, whatever your parents have told you, whatever the teacher has told you, I do not believe that those things have to be. Amen. I believe that with God there is always a way. Always. And see, that's the message we have for the world. With God there is always a way. And you see, that's why as we walk in the Spirit, we're able to overcome the flesh. We don't overcome the flesh and then walk in the Spirit. So we turn to Mark chapter 9. We touched on this passage a little bit last week. But we'll touch on it again, or a similar passage. In Mark 9, 14, it says that when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. It's funny, in our world, you're going to find that the, what the world wants to do is talk and debate and fight about stuff. You're going to find that the goal of the world or worldly people is to draw you into discussions and arguments and battles. Just things to occupy your time and they keep you from doing the things you really need to be doing, Right? And straight away it says, all the people when they beheld him were greatly amazed and running to him saluted him. And he asked the scribe, what question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him and he foameth and gnashes with his teeth and pineth away. And I speak to thy disciples and I spoke to thy disciples that they should cast him out and they could not. And he answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him straightway, the spirit teared him. And he fell on the ground and wallowing, wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came upon him? And he, and he said, Of a child. And oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe. See, everything in the kingdom is about that. And I want to tell you something before we go any farther in the story is, people say, well, I don't know if I can believe. You know what? Everybody believes. It's what you believe in that makes a difference. Everybody's life in this room is filled with things that you believe. Things that you have absorbed, things that have become the focus of your life, things that you are staking eternity on, things that are the essence of what you, is important. We all believe. It's what we choose to believe in that makes a difference. See, it's not having faith in itself. It's what we have faith in. The Bible says have faith in God. Not faith in believing. We know it's, not, it's not the act of believing that does it. It's what we're believing that does it. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. And hopefully that's where most of us are today. Right? Hopefully that's where we are today, that we believe in some and we know we need to receive and believe more. Mm -hmm. 
And when Jesus saw the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind cannot come forth. This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. And so there's a couple things we need to grab a hold of if we understand this. Right? That with God, all things are possible. That we need to believe, and we need to, be, we need to know why and what we believe. And that that believing is not an inactive thing, but it's an active thing. You might be sitting here today and say, well, you know what, I, I, I only believe what I believe. I don't know how I can believe in something that I can't see or I can't hear. You know what? Um, you have to seek after the truth. Right? We somehow have this idea that it's everybody else's responsibility to bring you to the truth. Do you ever wonder why the Bible talks about how and few there be that find it? Um, you ever played a game called hide and seek? Yeah. Right? What what is one person goes and hide, what does the other person have to do? See. Which means they have to go and find them. Find them. Yes, yes. yes. So it, it's it's out there, and God has presented it to us, but you can't just sit here and say, oh well, you know, maybe one day whatever Pastor Tim is gonna be the thing that causes the light to go on in my head. Maybe one week, as Bruce is leading the worship, the song that they sing, that's going to be the thing that I need to hear. Right? Now, if you were a brand new person who didn't know anything about God and coming in here, hopefully that would be the case. But as we begin to grow in God, God requires of us that we would begin to take some responsibility for our life. And to say, you know what? I need to find the answer. <clears throat> You know, Jesus was talking to the religious leaders of his day, and he says, you search the scriptures daily. Right? You search the scriptures daily to find what's in there, and those scriptures speak of me. i got to give credit to those guys. They at least search the scriptures daily. They at least threw themselves on their bed at night, crying out and saying, God, I need to know the truth. When was the last time you did that? When was the last time you, you skipped going to something else or doing something else because you needed to spend time to find out from God what He really wanted to do in your life? <laughs> Philippians chapter 4. It's great, you know, everybody sort of says, uh, well, you know, I'm... 25 or whatever, and I, you know, I, I figure most of the people I know, they die around 70. I know I've got like 45 years at least, 55 years, whatever, to figure it out. Um, you know, today I've gotten busy, I'll get to it tomorrow. Well, you know, funny thing how it is. Thousands of tomorrows go by before that thought ever enters your mind again. And one day, you, you have to decide that, you know what, today is the day that I have to find out. I have to care enough about what's happening in my life to find out. It's not just a case of after the service coming forward and saying, you know, Pastor Tim, uh, this problem in my life or that problem in my life, will you pray for me? Well, yeah, we'll pray for you, but, but when you come up here the 10th, 12th, 14th, 18th, 100th time and you ask the same question, the, the question you need to be thinking is, okay, so why am I coming forward to pray for this? Why am I not seeking after God to get the answer? In Philippians 4, verse 1, we read this, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Judas, and beseech Syntyche, 
or whatever his name is there, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help these women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. Some of you, that when I said those words, that should have been a big light going off to you. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Anybody here ever suffer from anxiety? <laughs> I'm not looking. No, no, I'm going to tell me what you want. Okay? If you're suffering from anxiety, do you know why you're suffering from anxiety? Oh, I know. You go to the doctor. The doctor says I have a condition. The teacher said I was had a disability. My parents said I never would amount to anything. Okay, well, I know all that story. We all have heard that story a million times before. But what does the Bible say? It says, be careful for nothing but... But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Have you ever read those passages and realize that the part following, the be careful for nothing, is how you are able to be careful for nothing? That's right. The word be careful for nothing means don't be anxious. King James Version, if you put it in modern. Don't be obsessive compulsive. Don't worry about everything. It is. It is. But that's the point, isn't it? It's be careful for nothing. And then it starts. But in everything, it's a discipline thing you have to apply to your life, just like whether it's healing or whatever. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. In other words, here, it's not the peace of God that comes from understanding it. It's not that God tells you what He's going to do. It's not that it all gets worked out. It's the peace of God that passes all understanding. Nothing in the natural has changed. Yet. Right? Right? But God's peace has come into your life. So keep your hearts and your mind through Christ Jesus. <clears throat> then he goes on. Finally, brother. You know, uh, I know people, I have relatives that uh, as kids, they used to sit up and they'd watch the latest horror movie, whatever it was. You know, they'd get together, the parents would be out, and they'd turn on the scariest movie they could find. You know, turn up the lights, sit around, and they all watch the scariest movies, and they all scare each other to death. And then, they grew up in their life, not able to sleep. And then they thought, why is that? Why am I afraid of things? Well, you know what? We, we talked at the beginning of the service it's about sowing and reaping. Okay? You want to keep sowing to that? Well, I can tell you what you're going to keep reaping. You want to keep investing in things that cause you to be anxious? Well, the fruit of that, well, you'll have an anxiety disorder. That's just the way it is. If you want to begin to reverse the effects of living in this world, you have to look to a source from outside this world, which is God, who then gives you the instructions about how you can have the peace of God. And you know how we can have the peace of God? Because once we have committed to, to God, God has heard our prayer and is already at work. Right? If you're going to pray to God, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I spent all the money they gave me, and now I have no money, and I've got 29 days left in the month. And I'll tell you, there's a couple things that have to happen in that, right? One, you have to learn from the lesson that I don't spend all the money that they gave me in the first couple of days of the month. That's the first thing I have to learn, because I don't want to go through the anxiety next month. The second thing is I commit it to God, and I trust that God has heard my prayer, and God is making a way to bring a solution into my life. And so I say, well, you know what? What can I do about it now? I give it to God. I walk in obedience to Him. And He shows me the steps about how we can, His provision can provide for me. But I don't do it the next month and then say, you know, God, I'm anxious again. 
I, I've got to, uh, sooner or later I've got to say, you know what? That's craziness. I've got to stop doing that. I've got to say, God, you give me a plan that works because I obviously can't handle it. Right? If I go my way, it's going to be a mess, oh God. Show me how I can do what I should do that I might walk in your peace every day. That I might walk in your blessing every day. That I might walk in the abundance of your provision every day. And then he says to us, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. Do you ever think about the things that are true? Or do you continually tell yourself the same lie? <laughs> right? Tell yourself the same lie. Nobody likes me. Right? Say it. You know, say it. Keep repeating it. No. That's not true. We all know for sure one or two people like God loves us. <laughs> Right? We also have to think about the fact that maybe there's a reason why some people don't like me. Right? You do wrong things to people and they don't like you. The Bible says, he who would have friends must first be found friendly. That's what I'm talking about. Is God wants to bring His truth into our life. We have to take a look and say, you know what? Whatsoever things are true. Whatsoever things are honest. Right? If I were to ask you, how many people were diligent with all their time this month? And some of you would go, and then I could say this word, honestly? Honestly? We all go, well, maybe not. Maybe not. Okay. Right? Like, I, pretty good, but you know, maybe not. Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. How many people would like it when you walked to the back of the room that people gave you words of encouragement, positive direction, um, uh, you know, just that kind of stuff, open doors for you, uh, you know, just for real friendly? Would you like that? How many people would like that? Okay, it's real simple how we get there. You be the first person to start. You be the second person. Okay? That's how it happens. We become what our expectation of what we want God to do for other people is. If, we want my, if you want your neighbor to always look out for you, start looking out for your neighbor. If you want to start changing your viewpoint, start turning off the television set. That's why it comes with an off button. Okay? It's not supposed to be your soul partner for life. <laughs> right? I'm reminded of the title of a book that says, Why why am I the first why am I the first one to change? That's right. Why, <laughs> why me? Yeah, why me first? Because <laughs> you asked. I'll give you a couple other scriptures as your homework, because we've run out of time. Luke twelve. 24 to 32, which is about the ravens of the field and the things we're supposed to do to have God's blessing. Luke 4, Luke 12. Luke 12, 24 to, to 32. Colossians 2, 6 to 9 which will tell you how you're supposed to walk day to day. And then let's pray together. 